Welcome back, everybody, to another live stream. And today we've got a special guest. We're going to be talking with our friend Maria from the company Art Toolkit. Um, and it's a little bit of a break from the previous live streams we've been doing. And we've been going really heavy into the art industry or art industry in the bike industry. And I wanted to combine uh, another passion of mine into these live streams. So we're going to have Maria on uh, the live stream. But before we do, I do want to thank our Patreon supporters for supporting the channel. It's what keeps this content going. And also just a quick shameless plug. If you like the content, be sure to check out our big cartel shop. We've got a new drop today. This is the new new. It's the, what I'm calling the further groovy hollow stickers. So, you know, we've been uh, selling stuff under this kind of logo for years. And it was inspired initially by Ken Kesey and the, the magic bus. And uh, you know, with the, the powers of holographic 80s retro stickers, I can now bring that vision finally to life. <laughs> uh, so with all that said, we're gonna talk art, water and watercolors and bikes with Maria. Um, and she's gonna give us at the kind of midpoint of this show, her three, uh, three top uh, beginning sketching tips. So welcome to the show, Maria. Hey, thank you so much. Super happy to be here, Russ. I'm a, I'm a fan of your work, both what you're doing with bikes and uh, love your art. It's really beautiful, your watercolors and the moods you, you capture and really evoke. So happy to be here. Cool. Thanks. I know some people might think that it's a little strange that I'm having, you know, it's basically a, a, a art product on this YouTube channel, but there's actually a pretty strong cycling connection. Can you tell us a little bit about your history with cycling? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I've always loved bikes. And I remember when I, you know, first finally had my own bike in like the seventh grade, the sense of freedom I had, I grew up in Seattle and, you know, it was before I could drive. And it was this sense of being able to take off across town and go visit my friends. And just that like empowerment of you're on your bike. And I, I've really kept that with me in high school. I would commute to school on bike and then um, hanging around the other people who rode I got roped in a little bit, um, especially once I went to college in uh, Northfield, Minnesota, I went to Carleton and some guys noticed I had a road bike and threw me a kit and said, come, come ride with us on the road racing team. So I actually uh, raced in college and um, worked at a bike shop part time and built up one of my own bikes and just it's, it's just always been how I've gotten around. I, I get impatient and restless in cars. I, I love <laughs> I love, still love the freedom of being on a bike and, you know, the built-in yeah. exercise, like getting from point A to point B and you just feel good when you get to point B. For sure. And you, you said the, I think you said when we were talking earlier, your road racing bike was a Thai bike? Yeah, you... I have an old, I, I worked with a, a shop in Seattle many years ago called Thai Cycles. And so before I left, I bought one of their frames. It's a, a titanium frame. Um, I think it's like a Sandvik frame. And I have a few bikes now. I, I always want, you know, one more. Um, but I've got my racing bike, which I still, I can't let go of that one. Um, but I then a few years ago, actually about five years ago, after my daughter was born, I wanted a more of a city bike. So I bought a 1984, like Trek mixed frame. And uh, so I could ride with her in the little front seat. And now I've got a nice little basket on that. And it's really my everyday ride. Uh, and then we have our cargo bike that I ride just about every day. I'm just back actually from the beach where my daughter and I rode. And um, we rode down together and then I hauled her back where we towed her little bike. And it's my favorite thing to do as a family is get out and ride. Yeah, so that bike in the, the thumbnail, that's the Bike Friday holiday, right? Yeah, and it's built up by a shop in Seattle we really like. A shout out to G and O Family Cyclery. And oh yeah, Davy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So Davy, we met them back right when they were opening up their shop in the original location. A real tragedy. They were part of this um, explosion in Greenwood, Seattle, right. that blew up their shop literally. Um, but so yeah, they built up that bike and they they built it in a, a configuration they call the Paula Abdul or maybe the Hala Abdul model. So like extra beefy wheels for the heavy weight. And uh, it's just a real sweet, comfortable ride. And my husband and I both ride it. We just switch up seat height and I love it so much. <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> cool. So you've got a business art toolkit, but your personal like artist website is called uh, Expeditionary Art. I'm going to bring it up real quick. And it's, it looks like, or it sounds like you've done lots of kind of big trips. 
uh, to, to create watercolors. Can you tell us about some of that? Yeah, yeah. And, you know, it's only just as of February that Art Toolkit actually formally split from expeditionary art. So it's still feeling very new. Um, expeditionary art, the idea of traveling and painting has been my passion for, it's been about 20 years now of um, using art as a tool to really explore places and think of, you know, art as a tool for connection, for exploration, for, um, for, cultivating just our mindfulness and awareness and having fun. And I had the opportunity to travel both with my family when I was younger and then in college and having a sketchbook just always really grounded me in a place where both locals, people I would meet would come over and we'd have these great conversations and would help me notice things I might've otherwise just passed by. Whenever I sketch something, I remember it much more vividly. And so I, I knew that I really wanted to put together, you know, something along the lines of combining art and being outside and then an educational component. So expeditionary art, um, whenever possible, I've collaborated with scientists to try and help promote outreach of their uh, climate science through art. Mm -hmm. Cool, so where, where, have, where are some of the places you've gone? Yeah, oh, great question. <laughs> so uh, after I graduated from college, I had what's called a Watson Fellowship, the Thomas J. Watson, which is kind of a crazy opportunity they give you a chunk of change to go and travel the world for a year. And you just can't go, you can't return to the US in that period. Or if you're a foreign student, you can't return to your home country or the US. And they want you to go out and push your comfort zone. And so I had this project that was exploring remote regions through art and ended up painting in, um, I wanted to go to remote regions. So I started with an extremely kind of easy climate with French Polynesia and then um, the high Tibetan plateau Mali, West Africa with Tuareg, where I uh, did quite a bit of studying in college, um, where I, I studied French and culture and um, really had, had some wonderful time there and then finished with Greenland. And that time in Greenland really helped kickstart the kind of climate component to my work where i um, really focusing on painting yeah. ice. And uh, that, was a, that was a crazy trip. I, on that first time in Greenland, it was literally hitchhiking I mean, hitchhiking helicopters. I was sketching and meeting, you know, the scientists and pilots. And so I had opportunities to visit Diamond Hunter camps in the mountains and the uh, National Science Foundation permitted me to visit Summit Camp, which is the science research station in the very, at the apex of the Greenland ice sheet. And I had a residency with a local museum in Northwest Greenland for about seven weeks. Um, and, uh, uh yeah, so sounds, and then, sounds um, cold. <laughs> yeah, it was, you know, so I, I'm inspired in part by my father who studied sea ice. So, you know, when I was little, I got curious about okay. <laughs> uh, these places. And sometimes I wish he'd, you know, been studying in the Galapagos and I, I'd have warmer fingers. <laughs> <laughs> so tell me, like, uh, I, I remember stumbling upon your, your website for the first time and ice seems like really hard to paint. I mean, especially in watercolor, because it's, you know, you, you can't put the highlights on after, right? So how, how do you approach painting, you know, something so white and, and so light with watercolor? Oh, that's a really great question, Russ. And um, I think watercolor is just this beautiful medium for it because it is so transparent that you can build up these layers and get like some luminescence with um, depicting ice. And ice ends up to me being really architectural where there's these facets to it. And so um, just being aware of those edges and kind of building out a sense of dimension. So for me painting, there's kind of this magical point where I'm going from just working on a flat image to kind of building a sense of dimension and architecture. Um, and uh, I've got on my blog um, a few technique demonstrations of um, like my homepage image, how that iceberg was built up. And I have a few sneaky tricks I do when I am in my studio and, and one is masking. So I'll actually use packing okay. tape and cut out around my packing tape to really leave those white areas so I can paint these big backgrounds. Um, I don't do that in the field, but uh, out in my studio, there's... Um, there's, there's no rules to be broken in my opinion in the, <laughs> in the watercolor technique. <laughs> right, so I'm sharing a, a, a screenshot of your website and just, you know, it, to me, when I see this, it seems like such a daunting task with watercolor, um, just because you have to protect the highlights so well. And for, that, for like, I get really anxiety ridden when I have to do that. <laughs> yeah, that's the trick with watercolor is um, 
when I think about, you know, the three big steps of a watercolor, you paint your big areas and protect your brights, then work up texture and then go in with those darks at the end. And um, practice, practice, not perfect. Yeah. <laughs> That's one of my mantras. <laughs> nice. Cool. Well, how did that artistic practice eventually lead to Art Toolkit, uh, the product as we know today? Yeah, that's a great question. And I, I wanted to share just a little bit of my background too, talking about travel, because I, I brought something really special that I want to share with you, which is um, through my father's teaching, I had the opportunity to live in Japan in Tokyo some when I was younger and really befriended um, and was befriended by and mentored by a Japanese brush maker named Mr. Sakuma. And I actually, most of my paintbrushes that I still use are all made by him. I've been really spoiled. I sometimes feel like I have this fairy art godfather. Um, and so when I was 11 or 12 years old, before we left Tokyo, um, his wife chopped off my ponytail, which was a little less curly then. And um, he told me that in Japan, it's a coming of age gift to make paintbrushes for kids out of their own hair. And in Japan, that was a really early experience of me for bri art bridging cultural differences and language barriers because we'd sit, I'd sit with friends and sketch. And so it was this real opportunity to communicate and connect and enjoy each other's company. And so, um, yeah, Mr. Sakuma made this brush for me before I left. And uh, it's really been a reminder for me about that idea of art as a tool for connection. And um, just the, I think, I, I think a lot about community and creativity. And uh, especially in this period, that's been a mantra also for me that, you know, we get through this isolation through community and creativity. For sure. Um, so is a, is the brush purely decorative or have you painted with it? I have not painted with this one. <laughs> you know, I paint with all the rest of mine. And um, <laughs> when he made this paintbrush, he gave me like this consolation brush because I think I kind of missed my hair. So he gave me this brush because he said, you know, it's going to take a couple of weeks to make this. And I have painted but with my consolation brush. This is a beautiful... <laughs> Uh, you need you need some big buckets of paint to dip this in. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> um. That's cool. I'd, I'd be curious to to see what the the brush properties of human hair are. It seems like it would be kind of lean more towards squir squirrel and and a little bit on the the floppy side. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it might depend on kind of whose hair. And <laughs> <That's true. laughs> I think mine may not be ideal. <laughs> the girl. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, so the art toolkit. Um, Every time I go on an expedition, I, I tinker with my tools. I really love and embrace just the DIY ethic of like, you know, you're putting together a kit, um, whether you're, you know, going out on a bike ride and packing up your essentials or going backpacking. And I get a lot of pleasure out of putting things together and knowing, mm -hmm. you know, what they are and where they are. It just, you know, it gets that part of my brain going. And um, so like one thing actually I, I have back here, that I usually build before an expedition. I, I make these drawing boards uh, out of gator board and I make these in some different sizes. This is a bigger one. So I can open them up and ah, have my paper inside and then nice. I can use it as a drawing surface. So people always ask me about this and I've been meaning to post some tutorials but it's just basically two sheets of gator board. And uh, <laughs> I, I love this in the field and then I, I Velcro it to a tripod mount nice. to uh, stick it up. And, um, and so, God, about 10 years ago, I did this trip to work on, in Northeast Greenland uh, with a walrus researcher. And it was a really neat trip because we were on this little island in Northwest Greenland, sneaking up on walruses to try and take little tissue samples from them and watch them through binoculars. And I was mostly sketching them, but to sneak up on walruses, we were putting on like full body machinist suits because it was a really sandy place. So we'd have all of our, you know, puffy gear and this big machinist suit. And then we'd be crawling kind of commando style oh, wow. on sand. <laughs> and um, it made keeping track of like my microphone, I wanted to record the walruses and my camera and my sketchbook, they'd like, you know, kind of fall down my pants. And, and then I'd Get to my destination have to wiggle them all out and anyhow on that trip my palette and sketchbook were in these separate containers and um oh i should have pulled this out before <laughs> i've got one of my original early palettes here um in this altoids tin but uh i knew i wanted to put together something more all in one and that's where the idea of the art toolkit really got started with um mm -hmm 
doing a really slim watercolor palette. That's um, basically this type of modified business card holder that we've made changes to to really try and optimize it. That can be filled with pans. So they're really shallow. So it's slim and fits inside a kit. Um, and uh, it, it's, I've iterated and iterated on it several times over the years. Um, but that, that was really how, where the yeah, how, came from. How has the design changed? Like what were like some ideas that they only came out after using it for a while? Yeah, you know, a lot of it went from originally when it was like the palette, for example, with a business card holder, um, used to have like side lips and a higher lower lip. So it blocked the paint areas. And so we were able to, um, I now have these custom manufactured. I work with a factory. So it's a really nice low lip. And um, I have these side walls on it that to try and keep the paint from just washing out like when you're mixing it. Um, and then I've made an even smaller tin. So this is one that we launched last year that, I mean, come on, it's really cute. It's half the size. Super cute, yeah. <laughs> um, and then with the, the kits too, uh, I originally, I, I changed the pocket configurations and added sizes um, to really try and have things fit really efficiently, the, the tools. Mm -hmm. And um, I, it's still a work in progress. I've got, I, I like to make things rust. So there, there's lots of little ideas. <laughs> I can relate. I'm going to, I'm going to queue up some video here so you guys can see the palette in use. Uh, my first interaction with uh, the, the palette was on a trip with Swift Industries, they were doing a three-day, you know, supported bikepacking trip in the San Juans with Chris McNally, who's kind of a, a pretty well-known illustrator. So, you know, the the whole purpose of the trip was to make art together with with fellow art nerds and art nerds, and have Chris uh, do some instruction. And I remember when we first got these, everyone was like amazed at how tiny they were. Uh, the fact that they were filled with Daniel Smith paints, which if you know you're into watercolors, you know like you know Daniel Smith makes some of the the best uh, paints out there. I fast forward a little bit, and it, it was just a, such a great trip to 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 make art and ride bikes with people that were also interested in in doing the same thing. Because typically, you know, I would go on rides with other cyclists, but I'd be the only person that would want to stop and and you know do some art making. But on this trip, it, it was awesome, and I remember thinking. Gosh, these are small, but while using them on the trip, they actually work really, really well. You know, I had all the colors I needed. The uh, mixing area was just about the right amount for maybe one and a half colors. At the end, we we took a tour of Daniel Smith. Uh, the the I don't know if they make the paints there, but they have a, an amazing store, and uh, it, yeah, it was a pretty cool experience. So, how did you how did you get connected with a uh, Martina and Jason from Swift Industries. Yeah, I uh, I followed their work for a long time just because they make such beautiful gear and, and being in Seattle. I think it was actually at a Mountaineers fundraiser in Seattle where we both donated some goods that I first saw one of their packs and thought, oh, I want that and I bid on it and I, I should have bid a lot more. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, finally we met um, last year in person and, and I was, was really thrilled too because we have a lot of crossover where Jason has done a lot of volunteering with um, my old high school Garfield High School with the outdoor education program and working with their um, bike trips and um, and so a, a lot of crossover and I, I just really admire the company and all the intention they put into it and building really quality gear and uh, was thrilled to get to collaborate and um, help set you guys up with that trip because it's that's just it is if you're going on an adventure I mean, that, that's one of the best times to have your art supplies with you. I mean, when I'm at home, it's harder for me to make art because my daily life can get in the way where I've got an almost five-year-old of, you know, just to sit down and, and make that intention. But when I go out, you know, it's this chance to kind of clear my head. And then I pull out my kit and I, I carry my smaller one just everywhere. It's just my everyday carry. And I can pull it out and I, I don't care about what I do. My goal is just to make something. And even right. on an expedition, my goal is always about quantity, like three to five sketches a day. And I don't care if those are the quickest little sketches or a big painting, but um, just to pull it out and sit down and make something. And I always come away with, you know, just a little more mental space and quiet and appreciation of where I am. And so um, that idea of helping to equip people and set them up to, 
to bring that into their lives when they're out on adventures, big or small, is something I'm passionate about. Yeah, for sure. I can I can totally relate to you know being at home and staring at a, a bigger piece of paper. It's very intimidating, but somehow when I'm on the bike or traveling, and I'm working out of a sketchbook and you know the paper size is just so much smaller, I can just jump in and make art rather. You know, being at home, it's like, oh, I'm I'm making art, capital A, rather than <laughs> rather than just enjoying the act of painting. So I can totally relate to to how you know working you know smaller scale is a uh, you know it's just a good way to to pr produce a lot of it. <laughs> yeah, and giving yourself some of the fresh eyes too. You know, when we get out of our house or even just out of our neighborhood, sometimes it's easier to sit down and and look around. And actually, that I mean, that is another reason I like making art is it can help me see things with fresh eyes of like you know, finding a little interesting composition to look at and, um, and uh, appreciate. Yeah, so you sell the palettes both empty and preloaded with, with paints. Is that, is that correct or? Yeah, yeah, so we, we initially were just doing, this is um, a little example of one of the ones we sell. Um, so uh, we sell some individual components and then two, a few versions of complete kits with some different colors uh, and the empty palettes, we have um, some different configurations of pans. Oh, this is, so this is one of the palettes designed on my colors. It's the Expeditionary Art Palette. So we sell them either empty with some different pans or pre-filled. And um, I really like, I think the pre-filled ones can be really fun. It's a, a nice opportunity to test out some colors, try something new, and then you can buy your own tube paints. And um, I'm really glad you like the Daniel Smith. I've been painting with them since 1995. And, being born and raised in Seattle, having Seattle made goods feels true. And uh, they're, they're real beautiful. The, the quality of the materials I think makes a difference. Um, yeah. I would spend so much money if I lived in Seattle at that Daniel Smith store. I mean, it's just <laughs> amazing. Beyond just, beyond just the paint that they sell, like they've got an amazing brush selection and paper selection. Um, at the end of that Swift Industries trip, you know, I was, I, I nudged Jason and, and Chris. I was like, can we, do you think we can end it at the Daniel Smith store? And I was like, <laughs> I don't know, does anyone else want to go? And the, the two other uh, uh, participants were like, yes. <laughs> so we just oh, had this art, art supply buying party. <laughs> oh, awesome. Go spend all <laughs> your money. did some damage to the wallet. <laughs> yeah. 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 No, I've been there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was wondering, I do, they, do you know if they ever do like factory tours where you can watch them make paints or that's probably, um, I don't know if they do that. They the, did the let us in once. So um, John Cogley, I believe is his name, the owner, he's been doing some nice demonstrations on lives lately. And um, I went to one in their store where they were talking about their Primatech. So their Primatech line are actually ground up minerals. So they get like tailings from mines, like leftover rocks and things that they use to grind up. And there, there's some just gorgeous pigments in there. And so during that demo, they gave us a peek into the back of the store in Seattle. And that's where they do a lot of the like tube fills. It's not where they actually do the grinding, but um, it was really fun to get a little peek behind the scenes at, uh, at how they do that. So yeah, maybe next time you're in Seattle and uh, we're all safely traveling. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> then you can come visit our showroom and little workshop too in Fort Townsend. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Well, let's move on to your three tips for, uh, for watercolors. Yeah, yeah. We'll see if I'll, uh, I might be able to do a couple little examples here. Okay. Um, here we go. So yeah, top three. Here's my first one. Whoop. There we go. Okay, my top three is squint. So <laughs> keep it simple. There's this feeling that we need to sketch everything and looking out at the world, and if you squint, you can focus on shapes and just some of the big outlines. So I'll often squint when I'm trying to decide what to sketch and make a little viewfinder. So I can decide if I wanna zoom in on something or have the big picture. And so thinking about shapes is just super helpful if you can be out looking for, you know, um, kind of circles or rectangles and just simplifying in some of those basic things. You know, even thinking about like a person with rectangles and triangles. So simplifying and seeing shapes, that's my number one. Okay, so my number two is kind of a fun one, Russ. And that is put it in a box. And so, you know, I already made this little box, but if you're sketching and you're, especially if you're new to it, 
even that page can feel a little intimidating. And if you can put your sketches in little boxes, this is a sketchbook um, I worked on last summer working with a scientist up in the Arctic of uh, North Slope, Alaska. And um, I often like to just put my, my little sketches, like paint little boxes around them or do, it's almost, this one kind of turned into like a little comic book, but a mix of some nice. little boxes and notes. Because if you just put something on a little box, you can keep that little box simple, add some notes around it and create a really engaging page for yourself. Mm -hmm. And um, it's all about, I think, kind of, you know, don't be intimidated, just diving in. And um, when in doubt, you know, put a little box around it and it's all of a sudden in a cute little frame. Uh -huh. um, the last one uh -huh, <laughs> is uh, really important. And it's something I think you do really well, Russ. And takes practice, especially with watercolor. And that is to make your darks dark. So to give a little example, pull out my board here. You can think about value, areas of light and dark. So you've got your darks, which will be near black. And then you can be aware of what your medium value is, kind of lightly shaded. And then in your picture, what your lights are, like we talked about protecting your lights um, with icebergs. So I always think about those brights, those mediums, and those darks. And watercolor is really sneaky because it dries lighter than we put it on the page. And so I think a big challenge for people is they end up with sketches that feel kind of washed out. Even with pencil, you know, pencil, it can be hard to get darks. And so if you can make your darks dark before you're done, before you call a painting done, squint at it and say, hey, do I have some things that look really dark? And if you don't add them in a few final layers and those darks make everything else pop and ties it together. And I, I think that's one of my number one big things I remind in every workshop I give is about those darks. And I see it in your work, Russ, where you get these awesome shadows that really play up the mood mm -hmm. and sense of space really well. Yeah, I think the shadows really pull everything together. Otherwise it just looks too two dimensional. And it's yeah. not until you have the really like dark, dark values that, you know, you get a sense of volume. Um, I like big, you know, I like, I love how trees cast a big diagonal shadow and that seems yeah. to kind of visually tie everything together. So that's kind of a recurring motif that I'll go to. Uh, but it's, it's super hard when you're beginning because <laughs> you, <know, laughs> you don't quite, you don't quite have the, the paint control. I think yeah. you know, one of the mistakes I was doing early on was, you know, it get too watery and I didn't know that, you know, there was a range of, you know, kind of consistency that you could aim for to, to get like, to get more pigment on, on, onto the page. Yeah. 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 There's a, there's, there's a few things I think about with that. And one is starting out. Um, and even if you're not starting out, but just to see every painting through to a sense of completion, because it's easy to be in the middle of a sketch or a painting and just think, Hey, this isn't going anywhere, but to see it through to the end. And um, mm -hmm. I mean, we could go, we could really nerd out on some of the art techniques, but yeah, thinking about, um, with those final darks in your paint or your pen, whatever you're using and um, being brave and letting it be kind of thick and even a little heavier feeling is, is just fine. Um, and, and something else I like to think about too is with your, um, with your marks you make on a page, confident marks are more important than accurate ones <laughs> with art <laughs> making because like you know I mean art is such a big idea and and big world and um but, you know not all of our images need to be like photographic they can be expressive and you know structurally incorrect I wish I, I wish I had this offhand but I remember some depictions of bike frames that were like tried to like computer models of like funny drawings and the bike frames were just all gnarly from, you know, where the tubes were all attached because <laughs> the drawings yeah. were also gestural. Um, but just to, to be confident and have fun with it. For sure. Um, I think I'm gonna open up to the questions in the Zoom. If you guys have any questions, just raise your blue hand and I'll unmute you guys. Um, yeah, one of the, my early challenges when I was 
learning how to paint was to stop seeing things as objects that my brain wanted to make three dimensional, but just to see them as shapes. I mean, it sounds so, so simple, but it's so difficult. Um, yeah. I think what, what the metaphor is that, that came in my head, it's, it's like trying to solve a puzzle and the answer is right in front of you, but you still can't get it right. You know, there's, <laughs> there's, there's something that, go, that goes wrong in the translation. Yeah, um, like our little neural pathways and their grooves. <laughs> yeah. So, okay, Andy, I think you can unmute yourself. Okay. How's that? Is that good? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Maria, it's nice to see you. I've got, a, a, I guess, a question and a comment and a request. Um, the first, the comment is I really enjoy kind of the, the widescreen work that you do. It really gives a sense of scale, and you don't see that a lot in with artists as artists kind of stick to their box or maybe a little wider kind of like an eight by 10 format, but that, that widescreen scope that you paint in really kind of gives a sense of being there, which I know is difficult in, in big landscapes is to kind of feel that, um, that, that grandeur of stuff. It really- Oh, thank effective. you. Thank um, you. The one kind of practical question I had is you're out painting icebergs with watercolors. <laughs> how do you keep the water from freezing? Like that, that's the first thing I thought would was how do you keep that from happening? Is it you use alcohol in there? How do you do it? Yeah, yeah, you got it. You know, I carry around a little flask that filled with vodka or gin, and um, I'll often sketch with these little water brushes, um, which are super handy. And if you haven't used a water brush before, we include them in the art toolkits or sell them individually on our um, on our shop. But you can just unscrew them fill them up and I'll do about a 50-50 dilution with gin or vodka and then can um, can sketch with them. Sometimes it's fun to actually let the paint freeze because it gets these cool patterns from the ice. But the trick is if I start kind of painting with popsicles, that's really ineffective. Um, so I found when I've been in really cold places, I'll often keep my sketches with color on a smaller scale. And then um, a number of pieces I've done have been a mix of field and studio where I'll work on these big wide pieces in the field uh, and just do the full pencil rendition, take color notes. And then when I'm back in my studio, I'll, I'll trace it onto a clean sheet of paper and do a full painting again. Because um, the way I like to paint in my studio is really to try and capture some of the atmosphere of ice and these big skies that I'm really drawn to that. And um, on that big panoramic format, um, and really need the studio space to do that where I have some consistency of climate and a, <laughs> a, a stable environment, the wind's not blowing, and, um, but to get those ideas. So um, yeah, making color notes and working small and then um, uh, having that all be available to refer to in my studio. Have you ever run into the case where you paint something in the field and you're happy with it and then you you get back to a warm environment and find out that it's thought out and is completely different than you, you thought you finished. Yeah, yeah, I was on a ship. Um, on, I had a residency on a um, expedition tour ship in Antarctica and just that thing happened. I was outside on deck sketching and like the paint was all frozen. I thought, wow, this is so cool. There are all these cool <laughs> textures and patterns. And I think what I really should have done is just let it just sit out there <laughs> until it would, um, Oh, what's the word when it would just go straight from the frozen and and uh, and slowly dry out? Um, but instead, I brought it in, and and within minutes, just all those beautiful patterns just were were into mush, and that was a little disappointing. <laughs> is this is so? Is are you sitting in your your studio now? Yeah, I am. I am. So I have a home studio, and then we uh, moved the art toolkit. Um, workshop that used to do all the art I, all I used to personally do all the art toolkit assembly and all the shipping and it was only in about the past um year year and a half that we began hiring some help and my husband um helps with the business now too and his <laughs> my mother-in-law does most of the shipping and we have a few um kind of a, a small team locally who also help with assembly and, and we have a lot of fun um and just it's been really nice to have an outside space especially with the daughter and it, you know, people were in our laundry room working, which was not sustainable. So, <laughs> but yeah, this is my studio here. You, you feel comfortable giving us a studio tour? I could give you a little peek. You know, it's pretty messy right now. Um, well, all the yeah, best studios so are, that. so it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> now, you can see some of my brushes behind me, and I do. I have a hanging line, so I like to hang studies up. And um, to hang my brushes, I have a square dowel 
and um, it's got little finishing nails so that I can um, hang my brushes up. And I've got a really cool desk that I kind of finally turned into more of my dream desk. And I'll, do you mind a shaky camera for a minute? I can give you a little. That's fine. My I desk. go for it. Yeah. Um, okay. So my desk. Whoops. My desk is on a. Um, it's a big flat file that I inherited from a closing company in a shipyard on, um, in Ballard in uh, Seattle, where my father-in-law used to work. So it was custom made for this warehouse of a company called Marco. And it was one of those things I just lucked out with because it's got, I don't know, about 12 drawers and painted it. And so I finally have a great big desk with more storage, which made a big difference. Are you able to hide away? Yeah, I know having a five-year-old would probably be no. a challenge. Can you, is there any way to hide or is it just? <laughs> no, I mean, honestly, that's one of my biggest challenges right now. And, you know, I think um, I had a show plan. So my last expedition was last summer and I um, spent two weeks up in Alaska with an ornithologist who's a real character. His name's George Devoki, and he's been doing uh, research on Guillemot, um, the small a uh, seabird that overwinters in the Arctic consecutively for 45 years. So every summer he's gone and spent time with this population of birds and has this crazy long data set. And so I went up there with a teacher friend of mine who works with him on his board of directors and painted. And we had a, an exhibit planned with a museum locally here in Port Townsend and events in Seattle. And it's just all been pushed back. This is going to be my period of painting. And um, without childcare, it's been really hard to carve out time in the studio. I do a lot of sketching because I love going out with my daughter and sketching. And so, I mean, sketching and biking is what I do these days. It was what I was just doing earlier today was out on my bike with my daughter and we sit down and make art together. <laughs> um, but I, I'm looking forward to getting some more concentration time in my studio. It, it usually comes in sort of periods where I'm generating for like an exhibition and then another big project and um, things are feeling just sort of paused right now. But the flip side is I've been having so much fun with the art toolkit community and doing live streams. And it's it's really pushed me um, in some other directions. So I've been really rolling with that and having a good time. I feel really fortunate. Yeah, you should, can, you, can you talk about uh, some of the live streams you've been doing? Yeah, yeah. So if you visit arttoolkit.com, we've got a live page. And so uh, weekly, I'm taking the next couple weeks off. But um, I think we did, I think we've got at least six I've been hosting demos with um, artist friends of mine from around the world. Um, some really terrific people locally in Seattle, a friend of mine, Che Lopez, is a real marvelous um, watercolor and acrylic painter. Jane Blundell, who's a real color guru, came on with me. Paul Wang, who is this amazing urban sketcher in Singapore, um, came on a few weeks ago. And um, Suhita, we've just got this real range of artists and it's been energizing to see um we've been kind of they're all people who also enjoy using you know the pocket palettes and art toolkits to see the different approaches to art and how they're using them and uh, it's been a real highlight for me and um real just just sweet to connect with people yeah so you i think you do the lives on youtube live or uh, instagram live instagram. right yeah and i've been posting recordings to youtube and we've been it, there's been so much learning i'm really impressed with your setup russ and so <laughs> um, i'm still learning trust me <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and you've been on a couple live streams where, where things have, have gotten rough <laughs> The technology. <laughs> yeah. So if uh yeah, if you guys want to catch the live streams, be sure that to follow our toolkit on Instagram. Um, I know when, when I get a notification, I'll, I'll pop in for a couple of minutes and then you know, try to watch the rest of it on your YouTube channel. So, cool. Yeah, Are there any other any other questions in Zoom? No. Um any questions in the YouTube chat? We're going to turn it over to you guys and I can take this opportunity because you, you know the analytics tell me I should do this. But if you <laughs> guys are enjoying the video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up. It helps with view velocity, spreads the video, all that good stuff. Uh, keeps keeps all the content coming. Um, so let's let's talk brushes a little bit because I'm a super brush brush nerd. What are your go to brushes when you paint? Yeah, that's a really great question. And I, I have a little collection over here and I've been a little bit spoiled because I'm, I've am i really become buddies with um, Rosemary Brushes in the UK. <laughs> and they've been giving me um, a lot of these to test out and we've been offering a number of them on our website. But Russ, I love these. Have you tried these travel brushes yet, Russ? 
I um, I bought I bought one of the I think I bought the small dagger. I forget which one that mm -hmm. was. Was that the R R12 or I think the, the R12. And coming soon, yeah. uh, we've got the larger dagger. And basically mm -hmm. these are brushes where um they have a, a cylinder they fit in. And so, you know, the water brushes we use are just fantastic. They're you can do a lot with a water brush, but sometimes having um uh the just a, a springier tip. You can do more calligraphic marks. And the, the rosemary brushes in particular, I'm, I'm a huge fan of um, made in, in England. There's other companies you can, you can buy travel brushes from as well, for sure. Um, but then I, I started carrying these recently because I've used one personally for years. Sea to Summit is a camping uh, outdoor gear company and finally let me carry this super cute water cup. Um, so I just nice. stuffed this in my art toolkit. My art toolkit, I, it's kind of like you, you always have room for one more bike in your fleet of bicycles. There's, <laughs> there's always room for a, one more tool to stuff in my toolkit. Um, so I always have a cup and uh, a few of these brushes. Um, and they're, they've been, been so much fun. Um, in my studio, like I said, I've been most familiar with uh, Japanese style brushes. because That's what I've really grown up with painting. Um, I love these big hake they're called for painting over large areas. And it's, this, this is the kind of brush, especially for a, a big painting, you know, if I'm working like 20 by 40 on that, that scale, I'll use these. Um, and then I, I really enjoy, um, oh, this is a newer one. Um, you know, a mix of kind of horsehair and weasel. Um, that said, I have some really beautiful brushes that are also, um, let's see if I can pull them out here. Are the hake, are those goat hair or do you know what the You know, the I think is? they're a mix. I think goat hair and then, um, oh, I can't find my other big Western style. Princeton and Co. brushes though, they make some really nice um, paint brushes. Oh, here we go. So this is a company I like too. These um, are actually synthetic and really well, nice quality. Um, and this is a Princeton and Co. 4050 line. Um, I'm going to be trying out more of the rosemary brushes just because they, they do make studio and I haven't tried their studio. Um, but if you were to have yeah. just like three studio brushes in your arsenal, I would really recommend um, a flat. So something between three quarter inches and an inch for just like wetting your paper. Even in the field, I'll have a little um, with my small like postcard size stuff a flat brush. And then I'd recommend having a little round. So something along the lines of, um, you know, a little, just, just a little tip that you can have. So for, you know, kind of your all around brush uh, for working and then just like an itty bitty little brush if you want to work on some details. And um, with art materials, you know, talking about sketching tips, investing in a few, high quality materials will improve your overall experience. And you know, Russ, that's like why we use Daniel Smith materials is they're more expensive, but the paint goes further and it's just such a nicer experience to work with. And with paper too, if you yeah. are getting into watercolor, letting yourself paint on some good paper will improve your experience of how the paint behaves um, in terms of like putting a wash mm -hmm. on and, and seeing the, the wonderful expressiveness of wet and wet and, and how that, that, that works out. Um, and so, and then with brushes, you know, if you can just have three brushes instead of, you know, it's tempting to have, you know, dozens, which <laughs> I do. <laughs> but uh, I have a, a lot of brushes too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> goes along, goes along. Yeah. Hmm. yeah that, that, that was one thing that was a big aha moment was when I started investing in nicer paints and nicer paper, I would do the same exact technique, but the, the colors would be more, more vibrant. Um, there's, it wouldn't cauliflower as easily um, in particular, like with, with, with nicer paper and you could yeah. just do more techniques and it dawned on me. Yes. You know, I'm still learning. There's limitations to my skill, but I'd hit a point where the, the materials were starting to kind of make the, the experience not so, not so pleasurable. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. And, um, and, you know, with good paper, just paint on both sides. My old paintings, I just rip up and turn into little studies. And um, I practice, 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 not perfection. <laughs> <laughs> so I have a question. When you use the big hockey brush, how mm -hmm. do you use that throughout the entire painting? Or is that for the initial wash? Or do you go back in and with more detail? Yeah. Like at what point do you start to scale down? 
that's a great question. So I use my big hockey brushes um, to wet my paper and to lay on skies. And I do a little technique that I haven't shared too much actually online or in any of my instruction much, um, where I'll even do a little tiny bit of dry brushing. There's kind of sweet spots and I paint some of these big skies and I'll soften up clouds with a big soft brush. And then um, once I'm done with that, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll come down in size uh, with my brushes and I'll, I'll usually just have kind of a consistent, um, you know, working my way down in detail, a mix of some of the dry brush and, and wet. And definitely, you know, I usually have a couple favorite brushes my hand always goes, goes for. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, I've been having, you know, with the rosemary brushes, there's with brushes, you know, ty different types of hair and experiences, whether um, a softer squirrel or, you know, a more springy synthetic. And um, a lot of it comes down to practice with what you have, you know, buy a few of those quality materials and then practice with them because ev everyone gets different preferences. And, and as you get to know your tool, you can really push it um, to, uh, to, to see kind of the, the extent of, of possibility. And I mean, I think that goes with any type of gear, right? Like, yeah. like push it and see <laughs> and get to know it. So you get more intuitive use. Yeah. Yeah. On the YouTube channel, like people, People know know me as like a tire nerd, but I'm also hardcore brush nerd. I'll buy the same brush in different material and apply techniques and see where you know a certain fiber works better than others. And at first, I was buying a lot of natural hair because you know, everyone said those are the best. They're definitely the most expensive. But I found in there's in certain instances, you know, I actually prefer a synthetic because of the snap. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. hold the shape a little bit better. And some of them, you know, the the newer like I, I'm a big fan of the. The Casaneo line by Da Vinci does have like lots of good water retention. Uh, for yeah, um, I'm gonna show show you a brush too. I just picked up for fun as well um, that a friend of mine recommended. This is a synthetic squirrel. It's a Princeton Neptune. This little mm -hmm. one inch and look, it's so short. It, it's short enough that it will fit in my art toolkit. So um, nice. <laughs> this is the new flat brush I'm playing with. <laughs> mm. Awesome. So I, I'm curious, like at what point? Did you did it dawn on you that our toolkit could be its own kind of self-sustaining business? Yeah, that's a great question. It really came about when um, we wanted to start a family and uh, it got to that point where Art toolkit was just kind of this part-time job because after college, I was fortunate enough to not have debt. That meant I had to have a really high income and I, I feel really privileged with that. And so I um, had the privilege of being lower income and doing a lot of freelance and just building my art. And so I did, you know, I sort of tried on every hat. I feel like when you're getting into something, you try out all the different models of how you can do it from, you know, I've done a mix of graphic design. Back in the day, I did oil painting in college and did some after college, which I remember when I sold my oils, it was like, whew, I'm committing to watercolor. I love watercolor. <laughs> um, and from doing, you know, trying art fairs and teaching and um, an art toolkit, was really aligned with my work in that like, you know, I like doing my own exploring and painting and I like developing my tools and I want to help empower and inspire other people to go out. And it just felt really, um, and people were always asking me about what I was using. And so I, um, it was turning into a, a part-time job around the time my daughter was born. So I was able to cut off, you know, kind of the freelance workshops and let those settle down and just focus on, you know, the first especially a year of being a, a mom is pretty intense <laughs> mm -hmm. and just kind of keep the business puttering along and then realize, wow, I, I have so many ideas I want to do with it, but there was just a real natural kind of long-term development and um, I'm really passionate about it. It's been so much fun. Yeah. So what are your, your hopes and dreams for Art Toolkit? Oh, oh, so many. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, in Port Townsend, we're um, working to set up a little showroom space and okay. would love to like start hosting more things. Um, my dream is I'd love to help it grow beyond just me as an artist, but that we can host other artist workshops, hopefully, you know, on demand or live on our website to kind of build that community. Because, you know, I've got my work to offer, but so many other people do incredible work. And um, we have a vision, you know, we've always had this vision of a company that's grown from my expeditionary art of being aligned with the environment and climate change. 
And I got to say, I'm really feeling so much more that with that is the social justice and thinking about how we as a company can step up and try to encourage the marginalized communities and other people to get out and have opportunities to explore and use these supplies. And the pandemics highlighted this as well as I think about kids in schools that have the, the, the means to set up supplies. And we already have um, an education program where we sell at deep discounts, supplies and offer curriculum with, with schools. And that, that's something I really wanna expand um, with the, the idea of how we can help um, people and in education use art as a tool for connecting with science and the environment and each other and um, really want to grow that. So kind of like an, an umbrella brand that sells, yes, a product, but education and, and other resources. Yeah, yeah. I'm, um, you know, I'm, I'm trying to build it into a brand that I'm, I'm proud of and proud to share with my family and, and proud to raise my daughter with. And I feel like being as conscientious as possible is, is not just necessity, it's, it's just the right thing to do. And I'm, right. we're, we're a small enough company that <laughs> we're, we're really working our hardest and, and want to do our best. And um, I, I really appreciate, you know, feedback and ideas from the community and, um, you know, seeing where people are using their tools, ideas for the next versions or people to connect with, just, um, just bring that on. I, I really appreciate it. And yeah. chances to connect with people like you. Thank, thanks so much for us. <laughs> yeah. So are you currently, do you have any online uh, courses that you're offering in the, the near future that people can sign up for? Oh, that's a great question. We, we just sold out of an adventure sketching live class at the end of June. Okay. I have um, a mini uh, sketching class called Tools for Observation that you can sign up for on that learn page or if you sign up for our mailing list where you'll get a little series of videos um, to inspire you and um, I'm looking to offer more for sure. So if you sign up for my mailing list, um, we send out, you know, a couple newsletters a month with ideas and news. And um, also, Russ, I, um, for any of your supporters, I've got a discount code and better make sure I get this right. <laughs> 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 um, I'll, let, I'll let you add that in the notes, but um, I'm really okay. happy to, get, uh, to offer a 15% discount to the, the supple, the supple, supple community. So, yes. Yes. <laughs> the learn uh, section here. So you got live demos. Okay, so this is this is where the uh, the Instagram live um, kind of sessions live. Yeah. Your workshop, so there's opportunity for people to sign up. Awesome. So yeah. how have you, I mean, were you set up for online teaching prior to the pandemic or how did you shift? <laughs> um. Yeah, you know, I'll give you a peek at my lights. We. You know, we do a lot of photography here and I don't have great light in my studio. So we bought um, these overhead lights. We started with one and then bought a second one just in like January. So that was really a big help. And then, um, you know, I have a couple of basic clamps and a lot of learning, you know, I wanna, <laughs> a lot more to do from the audio side and tech side, but it, it's been really cool to be able to com connect with a broader community of folks from other, geographic regions versus just coming to where I live in Port Townsend. And so I'm excited to do more. Yeah, I think it's been, it's opened up an interesting opportunity because there's some watercolor artists I follow on Instagram and I'm always bummed because I can never make their workshops. And, you know, a bunch of them have started doing online courses, which is awesome because now it's, it's not like location dependent. Yeah. Mean, it's not the same experience as, as being there and seeing it in person, but, you know, you can at least get a sense of their, their style and, and, you know, teaching style. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've enjoyed the live because it's it's like this, you know. I think people show up for it, and I like the the chance to interact. And um, we'll see if I can actually get an on demand shot and up soon. It's on my list. <laughs> yeah, it's hard to read the audience on Zoom, I and mean, even with the faces. So I'm gonna uh, unmute Andy here real, real quick, and we'll, I think we'll close out with your question. So you'll have to unmute yourself. You changed the buttons in Zoom before I could like unmute, unmute. people, but okay. There we go. <laughs> Um, right. I have, I have a, a technique question about the water brush. I know that um, obviously those are the most portable and a great way to go. And when I work with them, I go from dry brush to sloppy mess in an instant. Mm -hmm. What is the trick to work with those things? I just, I can't get my hands around it, I guess. Uh, okay, I got, a, I got a few tips for you, Andy. Good. Thank so you. one is when you, um, squeeze out a little water, you can squeeze a little water onto your palate first, 
or if you've got a palette that has like an, an extra mixing pan space, um, you can squeeze a little, a little space there. But then basically you've got a little puddle of water you can dip your brush into. Um, and, um, and then I always keep a paper towel nearby too. I, I really like these blue shop towels. They're super durable, they're nice and soft and you can rinse them out so that they last a really long time. And so I'll, I'll wipe my brush. Um, so I don't often squeeze water directly on the page. I'll often squeeze it first into a little mixing area on my palette, you know, get my brush around and then be able to hold it up and paint. The one exception to this is if I'm like painting a sky, I might squeeze a little water at the top of the page and then kind of pull down, you know, that blue as I go. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, or I might even kind of just pre-wet, you know, have, have a clean brush, pre-wet an area and then pull that color in. Um, Cause I agree, you know, it can get, especially if you feel like you go up to altitude too or something and all of a sudden water is just flowing out of your brush. Um, that water control takes a little bit of, of, of practice. So th that's, that's yeah. some of my tips there. Yeah, my pan, the pan always ends up like a mud puddle after five minutes of using those for me. So maybe, maybe <laughs> mm -hmm. you're, maybe you're set up with the multiple pans, the kind of the blank pans, maybe that's what I need. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and I make sure, you know, I don't squeeze water directly into my paints because otherwise they'll just get soupy. So um, mm -hmm. I'll, uh, I'll keep it to the palette. And then when my brush is a little damp, you know, I'll wiggle it around on an actual paint pan and, and then put it on the paper. But uh, all right. Good tips. Yeah, I hope that helps. <laughs> yeah, I need to avoid the big mud puddles. That's... <laughs> Practice. That's a good tip. It took me a while to figure that out because I, I thought the, the idea was to slowly try to squeeze water while you painted instead of thinking of it as a reservoir that just holds water and that you, you work with on the palette or something. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Otherwise, um, you could flood, flood your paper. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so I have one last technique question. Do you work, do you work at an angle? Oh, great or question. Or do you work mm -hmm. flat when you? Yeah. So, you know, if I'm outside sketching, I'll often just have my, my book. And if I carry paper, you know, it might just be on my lap and I'm real kind of, you know, wherever I am. And right now with the, with the sketching, you know, sketching, I'm just putting paint on paper or ink first, having fun with it, working quickly. And um, that's to me, you know, a sketchbook is kind of a safe place just to experiment with techniques. So I'm not worried about an angle. But when I am in my studio, um, I, uh, I, I prop my board off and up on a piece of wood. I've got this really pretty piece of glass. I was hoping I could show you, but I think it's a bit buried at the moment. Um, and, uh, and that little angle will let paper flow or paint flow, excuse me. And then I really like to work on gator board. And so gator board is my favorite support surface. Um, because it, it's so light that even my biggest sheets of paper, I've got gator board that's like, you know, five feet wide. Um, and, and it's not like a piece of plywood. It's light enough that I can pick up one side or the other side and, you know, mm -hmm. tilt it one direction or the other on my desk. Um, and when I'm working really large, I actually don't tape down my paper. I leave it loose, get the whole thing wet. Then I might even pick up just part of my paper or the other part and let the paint flow. Um, and, uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's fun. There, there, there's a quote I really like that I'll share with you from the book art and fear, which I read many years ago. And this is the only thing I actually remember from it. Um, but the quote goes, vision is ahead of execution. Knowledge of materials is your contact with reality and uncertainty is a virtue. So there you go. You've got your idea, <laughs> learn your tools, and then just like embrace the uncertainty. <laughs> and I feel like there, there's a lot of uncertainty with, with watercolor. You know, you can control it to, or at least for me, I'm speaking for myself, I can control it to some extent. But, you know, sometimes it has a, a mind of its own. You know, what you, you what, what I pre-visualize doesn't always happen. And you kind of just roll with the punches. It's almost this, this kind of battle between, uh, order and chaos. <laughs> yep. Yep. Just like embracing the beauty of the pain and, uh, exercise and yeah. letting go. Yeah. You've got that vision and that uncertainty is where you just let go <laughs> and uh, sometimes have to follow where the painting leads. And, um, and I don't know about you, Russ, but like in my studio, I'll do the same painting sometimes several times. 
And um, yeah, for sure. You know, I'll get to the point where I might go, it's ruined. And actually what I need to do is just step <laughs> away for a little while, let it dry and come back. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> yeah, that's the challenging part. There's usually in every watercolor I've done, there's a real like ugly part where if someone were just to look over, they'd be like, what the heck are you doing? You know, uh, but at, at the end, it, it manages to, to pull together sometimes. Yeah, <laughs> see, it, see it through, just see it through. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, cool. On that note, uh, thanks again, Maria, for, for joining us. And if you guys are interested in uh, some super portable pallets that you can take with you, you know, bike touring or just on the bike ride, I know that's how I've been killing some time here in uh, Missoula now that the, the weather is nice. Uh, check out Art Toolkit. Uh, she's got lots of great resources. Um, you can sign up for a class, uh, you know, follow them on Instagram and hopefully you can, you can catch one of their, their awesome live streams. And any, any last words? I just wanna say, you know, thank you so much and thanks for the work you do. And um, yeah, we'll, we'll go ahead and if you wanna post, um, share that discount code uh, if anyone wants to use that on any, any new supplies. and. Um, yeah, love, love getting out on bikes and uh, bringing, bringing it all together. So thanks so much and uh, hope you all have a good night. Yeah, cool. Well, thanks for being on the show. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you like it, like, share, subscribe, all that good stuff. And as always, keep the supple side down. <laughs> okay, stream is done. Yeah.